Welcome to the Fellowship San Antonio podcast. Our hope is that this podcast will help you to develop a life-changing relationship with God. So we're almost done with the subject of the wedding. And one more Sunday, um, no song could be more fitting then Amazing Grace, as we lead into today's topic, uh, part 11, the covering, okay? The 11th step in the wedding process of ancient Israel was this issue of the covering. And uh, the bride has, has been gathered up by the groom. We saw that um, two weeks ago. And, and last week was Mother's Day, but the, the groom has come and received the bride. We're going to uh, go back and review in just a few moments. But, um, but now she is with him and being presented to the Father. So turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles. Let's see here. Turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 4. And while you're doing that, let's look at um, a couple of wedding pictures here. There's the Yabaras. <laughs> A little bit hard to see, McClellan's. And then the, the next picture, um, several of you questioned this one, who this was in the bulletin. Well, that's Ray and Abby. Yeah. Very pretty, Abby. <laughs> very nice, very nice picture. Isaiah chapter 4. Would you turn with me there in your Bibles? Isaiah chapter 4, and we're going to come back to this in a few minutes, but Isaiah 4 is actually a wedding passage. I'm going to explain that more and show you how it is. But Isaiah chapter 4, um, beginning with verse 2, would you stand together with me for the reading of the word? It says, In that day the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and the glory of the survivors in Israel. Those who are left in Zion will remain in Jerusalem, will be called holy, all who are recorded among the living in Jerusalem. The Lord will wash away the filth of the women of Zion, and he will cleanse the bloodstains from Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of fire. Um, The woman of Zion is a reference to all the people, men and women, boys and girls, okay? And um, it's a reference to the bride that is chosen Israel is often looked at in the scripture as a woman or described as a woman. Verse 5, then the Lord will create over all of Mount Zion and over those who are assembled there a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Over all the glory will be a canopy. It will be a shelter and shade from the heat of the day and a refuge and a hiding place from the storm and rain. Heavenly Fathers, we come into your word today and as we continue our study on the wedding, and we see the redemptive plan of God as it as it unfolds in picture form in the wedding tradition of old. I pray, Lord, that we would be comforted in Your grace, knowing that we are Yours and Yours forever. That our sins are washed away; they are gone; they are hidden from sight to return never again. Bless our time together in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. So here we are, 11 weeks into this series, more weeks than that because of weeks off, okay? And uh, next week when we conclude, we're going to go back and review this just a little bit more, but just a quick look at the progress that we've made, remembering that the very first thing um, in the choosing of a bride in the, in the uh, biblical times was the father finding the bride for the son and then the son paying the bride cost. And, and so clearly that represents us being chosen by the father and purchased by the son. The covenant is established and Jesus said, this, covenant, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, you proclaim my death until you come, until I come again. And so we've made our way down and last 
two weeks ago, we talked about the coming. I'm going to come back and review that. And, and so the, the groom comes and receives the bride unto himself and takes the bride back to his father's house and to the chamber that he has prepared. Today we're going to look at the covering, or what's called the kupa in Hebrew, but I'm going to come back to that in a second, okay? So let's take a look at our, our review. Generally, when the groom came to get the bride was in the dark of the evening, often occurring in the middle of the night. Jesus said, uh, I come as a thief in the night. The street would be lined and pressed on people who carried torches on either side, and it was a very narrow way that the bride and the groom walked through to get from the bride's house to the groom's. And Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. There was a shout announcing the bridegroom, and it would ring out into the night, Behold, the groom has come. And then there would be the shofar that would sound, and the scriptures tell us, with the shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet call of God, Jesus will come to receive us unto himself. And the groom didn't enter the bride's house, just as the, when the rapture occurs, Jesus does not come physically to earth. We're caught up to meet him. The groom didn't enter the the bride's house. She came out and was gathered up by him and taken away. And it was called the taking. The taking. The Hebrew word niswin. The Greek word harpazo, but out of the Latin vulgate, we get the word raptura, raptura, okay, from we, which we get our modern English word rapture, representing the taking away, representing the rapture of the church. And then the groom would receive the bride and take her back to his father's house for the ceremony and the feast and to be his forever. So today we come to the covering, the covering. I'll explain this more, but for now, I want you to look. This is, this is the modern kupa, okay? Um, the covering in times of old was different, but now when a Jewish couple is married, um, they, the covering looks like this. It's a bit of a tent, actually, and the groom brings the bride under the covering, and it is here that the wedding ceremony actually takes place wasn't the way it was in, in times of old. The kupa has become quite formal, quite dignified, and quite different and serves a different purpose today. If you read up on modern kupa, it represents all kinds of things, uh, such as the house that they're going to live in um, and, and a variety of other things. But the old um, time kupa had an entirely different meaning and different significance that definitely relates to the redemptive plan of God. So the 11th step, the covering. You see, upon bringing the bride back to the father's house, the bride would be presented to the father. Now, I have to tell you that being presented to the father can be a scary thing. I don't know if you remember the very first time, men and women, that you met your father-in-law, your potential father-in-law, or father-in-law and mother-in-law. I remember very distinctly, because Joy and I have only been married four years, okay, and I remember the very first time that I met my father-in-law, my, my, my coming father-in-law and mother-in-law. At the time, I didn't know that, I was, that that's the way it was going to work. But I was meeting them. Joy and I had begun to date, and now I had to go through the meeting. Honestly, I felt like I was 18 years old picking somebody up to go to the prom, okay? Every bit of nervousness that could ever attack an individual attacked me that day. And it ended up being obviously a very pleasant meeting, and I loved my father-in-law and my mother-in-law, but it was very nerve-wracking for me. She, the bride, in, in the ancient times, had already met the groom's father because he was present during the time of the writing and establishing of the covenant. But now she was meeting him in a different way. She was being presented to him, and it was a nerve-wracking time for her. It was a frightening, frightening time. She had been snatched away... In the middle of the night. Think about that. What did her hair look like? What was her breath like? It was in the middle of the night. 
and, and while she was prepared, because in, in the sense that she knew the groom was coming for him at any time, and she must always be prepared, she was expecting the groom, but she was not presentable. There's a big difference between expectation and being presentable, isn't there? You see, we can expect something to happen. We can be prepared for something to happen at all hours of the day and night. But it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm presentable. My uh, smoke alarms can go off in my house in the middle of the night. And when I hear those smoke alarms, I'm going to get up and I'm going to respond immediately. It doesn't mean I'm not expecting a problem to happen in the night. I am expecting it at all times. And when I hear that, that noise, okay, I know what I need to do. I'm ready. I'm prepared. But I'm not presentable to the fire department. I'm not going to invite them in, welcome them in, you know, sit down, let's have dinner. Uh, no, no. You know, I'm going to rush to get dressed, and, and well, I, I think I am, or else I'm going to rush out of my house and, and eventually be embarrassed um, because of how all my neighbors have seen me here, okay? Big difference between expecting being prepared and being presentable, and she doesn't feel presentable. That's the beauty of this because that so well represents how we feel to make matters worse even. She's not just going out to meet the groom, but she's going to be presented to the father in front of all these guests. The street is lined with people. When she gets to the groom's house, there's going to be an enormous celebration that's going to be taking place. So it isn't just him and his father or him and his father and mother. It's everybody imaginable has shown up. And she has been awakened in the middle of the night and brought out into public. Knowing and understanding her discomfort. And that she's shamed because of her own imperfections. The groom removes his talit. It's his prayer shawl. It's a very, I'm going to show you a picture of it in a bit, but it's a very long shawl that hangs down. And he covers her over. It's called the kupa. Unlike the modern day tent that I showed you a picture of, in which they both stand under it, this is a personal covering just for her. Psalm 45, 13. It's Psalm 45, by the way, is known as the wedding psalm. It says, all glorious is the princess under her kupa. Isaiah 61.10. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and covered me in a kupa of righteousness. You see, the wedding ceremony would take place in a tent or a room that the groom had prepared. And then the bride would enter the chamber and there be joined by the groom only after she had dressed and prepared herself for him. He would wait until she called him, okay, for that preparation time. And the covering that he had placed over her in public would not come off for the public to see her until the bride and the groom emerged from the chamber about a week later. So she was covered and no one could see her until she was ready and they were ready to come back and be seen. The kupa, okay? The kupa represented two things. Number one, a sign of the groom's protection over her. And number two, a symbol of the groom's provision for her. I'm going to show you in scripture how this works out for us. But number one, protection Number two, provision. Protection, okay? Protection or defense. I have to stop here a moment. Have you ever been uncomfortable in your presentation to others? Embarrassed with how you look. Embarrassed with how you're dressed. I remember years ago when I was first married young. Um, one time my late wife and I were attending some function, I forget what it was, and we got there, and immediately, uh, Dorothy, my, my wife, was um, uncomfortable, <laughs> and finally she came to me, 
and she wanted me to take her home so she could change and come back. Seemed odd to me, but we did. And she was happy after that. On Monday night of this last week, Joy and I and Olga were invited to um, a Romanian home, and there was about 20 or 25 Romanians there. They invited us to dinner. And I remember thinking about, um, what what do Romanians wear to dinner? (laughs) Because when they come to church, when they meet here in our building, they're suit and tie people. Not all of them, but there's a lot more suit and, suits and ties than there is amongst our group, okay? And, um, and a lot of times when I'm with them, I always feel like that's how I should dress. Well, I was wondering, should I dress up that way for dinner? Well, fortunately, um, the men were dressed like I was dressed, casually, okay? So I was, I was comfortable. But I remember a time, um, many years ago, I had moved to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I was new there. And I was working for a friend in a warehouse. It was kind of one of those tweener jobs. And I was, I was um, between ministry opportunities, as a matter of fact, and I was working for this guy in a warehouse. And I had to show up early, 6 o'clock in the morning. And obviously it was a warehouse. I was dressed in warehouse clothes. Well, the annual mayor's prayer breakfast was coming up. And the owner of this business that I was working for invited me to go to that. I said, you know, I don't, I don't really want to go because... It's early, and I have to dress for warehouse work. And he said, no, no, don't worry, don't worry. Everybody has all kinds of jobs. There's plumbers and electricians and mechanics and business people, and everybody comes, and they're all casual, and then they get ready and go to work. So I said, okay. So I went. The speaker was the, um, the president of Piper Jaffray & Hopwood, which I was really excited about. He, he's a, it's a, um, an investment company. And, um, and I was so excited, looking forward to that. And I walked in the door, wearing my scruffy jeans, old tennis shoes, and a sweatshirt. And everybody in there was wearing a suit and tie. And there I was. I have never felt more uncomfortable in my entire life. Well... I didn't want to leave because I had promised my friend I'd sit with him. But I just didn't feel good about being there. Fortunately, it was South Dakota, and it was wintertime. And I had a big, heavy coat, and the coat was a nice-looking coat. And so I kept my coat on in there the whole time so that nobody could see who I really was, at least how I felt like I really was, just not presentable. I'm going to tell you, I felt like a donkey in the Kentucky Derby. I was in really great company, but I just didn't belong. Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. The kupa was designed to make the bride comfortable. It was her protection or her defense. If you still have your Bible open to Isaiah chapter um, 4, take a look at at Isaiah chapter 1, okay? In Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah the prophet is is seeing a vision here. And in in chapter 1 and verse 2, he says, Hear, O heavens, listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I've reeled children and brought them up, but they've rebelled against me. The ox knows his master, the donkey his manager, but Israel doesn't even know God, okay? My people don't understand. Ah, sinful nation. A people loaded with guilt, a brother of a brood of evil doers, children given to corruption. They've forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel. Um, verse 5 says, why do you persist in your rebellion? Um, verse 6 says, um, from the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there's no soundness, wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed, not bandaged or soothed with oil. This is how you look. This is how you look. He's saying spiritually, you look atrocious. You look awful. You are unfit people. If you go to chapter um, 3, in chapter 3, we we actually see a text that tells us that the nation had tried to adorn themselves and make themselves look better. An interesting passage of scripture, Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 18 says, in that day, the Lord will snatch away their finery, the bangles and the headbands and the crescent necklaces, the earrings and the bracelets and the veils, the headdresses and ankle chains and sashes, the perfume bottles and charms, the signet rings and nose rings, the fine robes, the capes, the cloaks, the purses, the mirrors, the linen garments, the tiaras and the shawls. It says, in that day, God's going to take it all away and expose you for who you really are. And who you really are is a disobedient, stubborn, rebellious people. Not fit not presentable to God. 
But in the midst of this atrocious picture, in chapter 4, we see the remnant, the branch, the chosen few. And it says, in that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. It says in verse 3, those who are left in Zion, who remain in Jerusalem, will be called holy. But look at verse 5. It says, then the Lord will create over all of Mount Zion and over all of those assembled there a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night over all the glory will be a, in the Hebrew, kupa, a canopy, a kupa. God puts a covering over his chosen people. The Lord has not forgotten his bride. The Lord covers us over. The Lord has prepared a kupa for us. You see, the kupa is Israel's protection. Protection against God, against divine wrath, against divine judgment, against the devil's schemes. But here's the wonder of the kupa, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the wonder of it. It protects the bride from the mirror. You see, it's my mirror that most bothers me. Because when I look into the mirror of my soul, I see Russell Schwartz differently than you do. I see my imperfections. I see my shortfalls. I see my weaknesses. I see the scars of my past. I see the things that I don't want anybody else to see about me. I see it. And when the groom comes for me to take me and present me to the Father, I'm embarrassed about those things. I was telling my men's Bible study Thursday morning, sometimes I'm out riding my motorcycle. And when, you're riding, when I'm riding my motorcycle, it's just a great time to think. And sometimes it'll flash into my mind something I did or said when I was 17 or 22 or 32. Years and years ago, a sin I committed, an act I did, something I regret. It's there. I see it in the mirror of my soul. But the kupa protects me. Now, let me explain the kupa a minute. The kupa was a covering. It's the Hebrew word for covering. The prayer shawl, and there's a picture of a prayer shawl. I want to push my laser button, but I'm afraid I'll shut the whole thing down. So I guess I'm not going to do that. But, but um, it's hard to see. But the prayer shawl went around a person's shoulders and hung quite long. There were tassels that hung along the bottom of it, but in the corners. And by the way, the hem... The hem of the, of the prayer shawl, the talit, was called the kanaf, the kanaf. Translated in the Bible, the hem of his garment. When the woman with the blood disease reached out to touch Jesus, she, she touched the hem of his garment. In the corner of the, the corners of the prayer shawl are what's called the zitzi. T-Z-I-T-Z-I, -I, zitzi. Those represented the word of God to the ancient Jew. In fact, the woman with the blood disease reached out and touched the hem of his garment, but laid hold of the zitzi because she knew the scripture in Malachi that said that Messiah would come with healing in his wings, or zitzi, they're called the wings. So the groom would take that prayer shawl and put it over his bride to protect her. Now turn with me in your Bibles to Ruth chapter 3. Ruth chapter 3. Joshua judges Ruth. There's kind of a misunderstood passage of scripture in Ruth chapter 3. I was online reading because I like to read what people have to say. And I got to tell you that this particular passage of scripture has an overabundance of ignorance of uh, people talking about exactly what it's, what it's in reference to, okay? In Ruth, in, in Ruth chapter 3, we know the story. Ruth, Ruth's husband died. She came back to Israel with her mother-in-law. 
She gleans in a field owned by a man named Boaz, who is a kinsman redeemer, has the right to marry her. She gleans in his field. And it says that at one time he fell asleep in the threshing floor. And Ruth came. And it says in chapter 3, verse 9, that he all of a sudden realized that there was a woman laying by his feet. And he wakes up and says, who are you? And she says, I am your servant, Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. The Hebrew word for corner is kanaf. Kanaf. Spread the hem of your garment over me, because you are my kinsman redeemer. Now, what on earth was going on here? Okay. Well, let's back up to Ruth chapter 2. And let's look at an earlier passage and an earlier exchange that happened between Boaz and Ruth, okay? Ruth chapter 2 and verse 8. Boaz notices Ruth out gleaning in the field and that she's quite attractive. And he wonders who that is, and his servants tell him who it is. And so Boaz goes to Ruth in verse 8. It says, so Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water, the jars of the water jars the men have filled. Okay, so he's taking care of her. He's protecting her. But let's drop down. And verse 12, it says, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings, Hebrew, kanaf, you have come to take refuge. So Boaz is saying to Ruth, God has spread his canopy over you. You've taken refuge under the canopy of God. The kanaf. Now we come to chapter 3 and we see that Ruth comes to Boaz, lays down by his feet, takes the kanaf, and covers herself with it when he wakes up and says, who are you? She says, I am Ruth, and she is there for protection, and she says, you are my kinsman redeemer. Claim me, protect me, take me to be yours. covering of God. You see, it's protection, it's peace. Back in, back in chapter 2, chapter 2 and verse 12, it says, may you be richly rewarded. The Hebrew is shalom. Rewarded is wages. Richly is shalom. May you receive peace wages from God, who has placed his kupa over you and its provision. We see a similar thing in Luke chapter 13. I'm not going to have you turn there. But in Luke chapter 13, Jesus is looking down over Jerusalem and weeps. And the scripture tells us that Jesus looked at Jerusalem, Jerusalem meaning city of peace, Jeru Shalom, and says, if only you had known what would bring you peace. Like a mother hen covers its chicks, Jesus said, I would gather you under my kupa. I would gather you under my kupa. was a place of protection. Secondly, it was a place of provision. You see, the groom covered the bride with the kupa, and now she came under his every provision. He cared for her. He provided for her. He met every need. In Psalm 19, I read, In the heavens God has made a covering of the sun, which is like a kupa, providing heat and light and warmth for everyone. We used to sing a song, truth and beauty and happiness. It's all in the name of Jesus. Health and heaven, peace and rest, it's all in the name of Jesus. Joy and gladness, forgiveness too, 
life everlasting and free, all that I long for, all that I need, it's all in the name of Jesus. Here's what I want you to know today. Number one, Jesus has placed his kupa over you. It's his blood. The word atonement means covering. We're covered by the blood of Jesus. And as ugly as I look to myself, when he presents me to the Father, the Father doesn't see my sins because those are forgiven, those are gone, those are removed, those are covered over by the blood. If you're laboring under the thought that one day you're going to stand before God and he's going to say, oh, I remember you. Oh boy, do I remember you. No. No. You're going to stand before the Father as Jesus presents the bride to his Father. And God the Father is going to look at you and see the covering that Jesus has placed over you. Protection. Protection from our past. Protection from the mirror. Protection from divine wrath. Protection from divine judgment. Protection from the, the accusations of the devil and protection from the mirror. And number two, the Father's going to look at us with Jesus, covered by his kupa, and realize that every provision of God belongs to you and to me because we are under the kupa of Jesus. Now, what are those provisions? Well, it's seen in the sevenfold name of God. He is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. The Lord will provide a sacrifice. You know, sometimes in my Bible study, on Thursday mornings, I have two men's Bible studies, one at 6.30 and one at 9. And I try to teach the men what the Word says, and it's a fun time. And sometimes I learn. And i got to tell you that um, Ken Sperlin, he came out with just the most profound thing that I've heard in a long, long time. And Ken said, the Bible tells me that God will remember my sins no more. And if he can't remember them, I'm not going to be stupid enough to remind him. Think about that. It's profound. I'm going to stand before God one day and realize that God has provided everything, including erasing my past. And it's provided through the sacrifice of Jesus. Jehovah Rapha, he's the Lord, my healer. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner or my, my protection. Jehovah Shalom, he gives me peace. Jehovah Ra'ah, the Lord, my shepherd. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, my righteousness. Jehovah Shema, the Lord is here, here, now. He provides everything I need and protects me from harm forever, forever. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every t- tribe, and every people, and every language. And, and there was a conversation. Who are these? And John said, I don't know. You tell me who they are. And the answer is, these are they who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And he who sits on the throne will spread his kupa over them. And never again will they hunger or thirst. The kupa of Jesus protects us from harm, provides for us forever. Protects us from eternal judgment, provides for us forever and forever. And so the bride, not presentable, but covered with the kupa, is brought by the groom to the father. And the groom says... This is the one that is for me. Protected, provided for forever. It's our eternal reward in him. You see, Jesus is coming. 
He's coming to spread his covering. He's coming to spread his kupa over you. To present you to his father without spot, without blemish, without wrinkle. God isn't going to look at you and remember your past. No, no, no. Your sins are remembered no more. God is going to look at you and see the covering that Jesus has placed over you. I like this picture, and I've shared it with my men in the Bible study. When I go walking into God's presence, feeling in myself, like that mayor's prayer breakfast I attended many years ago, Jesus has his kupa over me and his arm around me and says, he's with me. And it's okay. I'm with him. Covered. Forgiven. Washed clean. Protected and provided for. No shame. No guilt. No condemnation. A bride adorned for the groom. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Does the devil come and knock on the door of your heart and say, oh, 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 Pastor Russell knew what you were. He wouldn't... He wouldn't want you to be an elder. He wouldn't want you to be a deacon. He wouldn't want you to be a member. He wouldn't even want you in the door. Does the devil ever do that to you? Because the devil comes to me and says, oh, ho, ho. if they knew who you were, they wouldn't want you to be their pastor. None of us really like the thought of our past being an open book. Your past and mine. has been washed clean by the blood of Jesus, covered over with the kupa of his atoning sacrifice. And when I stand before the Father one day, I'm going to stand adorned in new clothes, the clothes of Jesus, his righteousness applied to me. Pray together with me. Heavenly Father, How I thank you for the the wonderful picture of the covering of Jesus' love. I pray, Lord, that we might live in the victory of knowing that this is true. I'm just going to ask you to remain in an attitude of prayer for a moment. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Think of all those things that your conscience bothers you about, you about your past, your memories your regrets, your failings, your sins. Things you don't want anybody to know, the things you don't want, you wish God didn't even know. Here's what I want you to understand. God has forgotten. You're covered by the blood past is gone and your heart is clean and when Jesus presents you to his father one day he presents you without spot or wrinkle without blemish claim that victory folks because it's true father help us to live victoriously because of the completed 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 work of Jesus on the cross thank you for the kupa Thank you for the covering. In the name of Jesus.